Welcome to the interview. I'm Ciara Pressler. This is Pregame. We are interviewing some of my favorite innovators, game changers, and creators. Today we are welcoming somebody who is all three and a very dear friend of mine, Dr. Aperna Bull. She is the Medical Director of Community Integration at UH Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospitals and an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine in Cleveland, Ohio. She's particularly interested in the intersection between environmental sustainability and pediatric public health. She serves as the chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on Environmental Health and as co-chair of the Healthcare Without Harm Board of Directors. She's also a, facility, a faculty affiliate of the Swetland Center for Environmental Health at, at Cape Western, a member of the Trust for Public Lands Ohio Advisory Committee, a member of the Lead Safe Cleveland Coalition Steering Committee and State of Ohio's Lead Advisory Council, and a founding advisory council member of the Ohio Clinicians for Climate Action. So we will be talking kids, we will be talking health, and we will be talking uh, environment. Let's welcome a Bull. Well, thank you, Sierra, for having me. And I should say that's Lead Safe Cleveland because oh. I know it's hard to say when you're looking at it, but but that's kind of one of our hot button environmental justice issues around here. So I want to make sure people hear it. But it's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the introduction. I'm excited for the conversation. Me too. Well, we never know where our conversations will end up because we do talk quite often, um, full disclosure, where I consider you one of my best friends. <laughs> and so likewise, likewise, but it's always a pleasure. And I don't always get to see your face when we do it. So this is a treat. Yes. Yeah, so we met when we were 16, I think. Yeah, I think maybe our sophomore year in high school. Uh-huh. And we were both in theater and choir and so performed together. And I, we became really close in that last semester senioritis time when we were like, let's go to the other side of town and sit in a coffee shop and talk about when we can blow this popsicle stand. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then have our, cross of pa our paths have crossed in other places on the East Coast and we stayed in touch in New York City. We got to reconnect and we've stayed in touch all this time. And I feel like even though we were both eager to kind of blow this joint when we were younger, I think we both also kind of returned to some love and nostalgia for our hometown. So it's always fun for me to see you when I'm back. I still stay back home, even though I haven't lived there since I was 18. Yeah, definitely. You get out to Portland at least once a year. So I do get to see you pretty often. Mm -hmm. Right. And yes, we were both in New York around our like age 22, first job out of college time. Were we both there? I remember, I always think what September is approaching about 9-11. Had you moved there? Because I yes, was- because I moved there in 2000. In October 1st, 2000, I moved to New York and I crashed on your sofa for the first month when I didn't know what I was doing or where I was going to live. That was fun. That was I, one of my favorite New York memories, actually. Yeah, and I think you pretty much returned the favor because I've crashed at your place in New York, too. So, I love it. Well, so now, you know, we, I, I think we could have known you were going to end up in some places where you are, but did you always want to be a doctor? I don't think I could have articulated that when I was younger, and I, I feel like I more entered this work because of caring about some of the advocacy issues that I work on now. I mean, I love actually taking care of patients, but I think the platform for the advocacy work is something that sort of led me to medicine rather than kind of the other way around. And so why did you choose pediatrics? Um, I think for a few reasons. I mean, from a clinical aspect, it's just kind of fun. You have this huge diversity of developmental ages you get to work with from infancy through adolescence. So I get to work with young adults and newborns and everything in between. I really like getting to work with families as a unit. And I also think that pediatrics is a little ahead of the curve among medical disciplines in really thinking about their patients within a larger context. You know, we, we are used to thinking about kids as being part of a family, part of a community, part of a household, you know, living in an environment that influences their health. So a lot of the contemporary discussions about, you know, social determinants of health and these kinds of buzzwords in medicine are you know, maybe the jargon is new, but the philosophy is sort of old hat to pediatricians. So I think it felt like a really good fit to me for a lot of reasons. So talk a little bit about the population that you have worked with in your career and some of the, the issues that have become important to you because of that. 
my patient population here. Yeah. You mean? yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, Cleveland is a really um, interesting place for someone who cares a lot about environmental health and justice because there's such a lot of work to do here. There's such a legacy in Cleveland of systemic racism and redlining and housing that continues to have huge impacts on our uh, community health. And we, we kind of are known, I guess, infamous for um, being kind of a poster child for that fact. Like a few years ago, I want to say it was maybe in 2014, there was an HBO special on how zip code matters more to your health than your genetic code. And it was neighborhoods in Cleveland that were used to illustrate that, that with two neighborhoods just like eight miles apart, one in downtown Cleveland on the east side of Cleveland, in a historically red line, disinvested neighborhood compared to a neighborhood eight miles away in a wealthier suburb, the life expectancy difference between a baby born in those two neighborhoods is 24 years, which is a huge number. Wow. Hardly unique. I mean, there are many other cities that experience this reality, but um, Cleveland has been kind of held up as an example and, and for good reason. We are an extremely segregated city and we have huge health disparities and pediatric outcomes as well. So I, I mentioned life dis expectancy, but the disparity between like black and white infant mortality in Cleveland is enormous. I think it's, it's maybe the worst, if not one of the worst in the country in terms of the, the difference. Same is true of maternal complications post childbirth and during pregnancy. Um, we have huge disparities in issues like um, developmental health and school readiness for children and all kinds of other health outcomes. <clears throat> so I actually practice on the east side of Cleveland, kind of in the heart of some of these uh, red line neighborhoods that, um, that were featured in the HBO special. We have a pretty large um, catchment area, so we have some geographic diversity in the patients we see, but definitely the heart of our practice is right and on the east side of Cleveland. And so um, these sort of downstream health effects of systemic racism, of some of these um, misguided housing and environmental policies, all of the other determinants that make up a community's well-being, a lot of those downstream effects are what I see every day um, in the patients that I serve. Definitely heightened at the time of COVID, and we can talk about that, but um, it definitely keeps my heart right where it should be, which is what people are really experiencing, what is the lived experience of our community because of some of these um, sort of systemic issues, and it really grounds me in my advocacy to focus on the real people that I serve. Yeah, you know, you mentioned or clarified lead. Um, I remember when Flint was in the news, you know, for its its lead content in the water, you pointed out that Cleveland has the same problem or possibly worse. That's true. So, I mean, I think the, the water crisis in Flint was obviously an outrage and an injustice that continues to cause people in that community to suffer. Um, I think it's um, I, I so admire the action of the community and the pediatrician, Dr. Hannah Atisha, who um, was really a whistleblower around the outrage that was perpetrated in Flint. Um, the good thing about um, sort of the ripple effects of that um, episode is that I think it turned the country's attention on the longstanding issue of lead poisoning and lead exposure. It is a huge environmental injustice that continues to exist in many American cities. I think the downside, if there is one, is that it, it created this big focus on lead in water and people forget or it, um, maybe never knew that in most cities, uh, housing, paint and soil are the primary routes of exposure. And it also, to lead, and it also, I think, may have created an impression that Flint was somehow unique in this crisis. And as you mentioned, um, cities like Cleveland, if you look at the prevalence of lead poisoning, are actually, it's actually far higher than in Flint. In fact, the city of Cleveland, the, the prevalence of lead poisoning is at least twice the prevalence of lead poisoning at the peak of the Flint water crisis. And that's just like our baseline. It's mostly from paint and soil. Um, and there are other, especially kind of Rust Belt cities, but a lot of cities with older housing and especially with, with older housing that exists in systemically disinvested and discriminated against neighborhoods where the infrastructure is crumbling. So it's not just the age of the homes and the neighborhood, it's how, how are they, have they been invested in? How have those neighborhoods been maintained? Um, if there's paint chips crumbling off the houses into the soil, like that's not a good sign in these older neighborhoods. And that's a fact of life in a lot of our neighborhoods here and in other cities like ours. So um, yeah, it, I mean, the prevalence of lead poisoning in some of the neighborhoods where my patients live is as many as one in four children. That is several times as high as the prevalence of lead poisoning in Flint at the peak of their crisis. So um, it's, it's a, the, the good news though, is that like lead remediation is one of those like slam dunk public health interventions when it comes to a return on investment. The only 
public health investment that even comes close would be something like childhood vaccines. But for every dollar you invest in lead abatement, the payoff is huge. Um, so it's, it's a problem we know how to solve. It's not rocket science, but we have failed for generations now to really muster the political will to get it done. The only treatment for lead exposure is to prevent lead exposure in the first place. So how, how is return on investment calculated when it comes to environmental health? Yeah, I think it's one of the challenges because um, in, in um, expressing a return on investment with interventions like these, because it sort of depends on how wide uh, you draw your circle. Like, that's why the range, even if you look at lead poisoning, is um, a, large, a large range if you look at the dollars of ROI, because you could look at just avoided medical care, but you also should look at um, increased productivity um, from, you know, no uh, less developmental toxicity, better school performance, less interaction with the criminal justice system, because lead exposure puts you at risk for that too. Um, so that that list can get pretty long. Um, but if you look at, um, at, at school accommodations, healthcare, criminal justice, productivity, that number gets pretty big. The same is true for other kinds of public health interventions like, like vaccines. I mentioned vaccines. I mean, you can talk about avoided healthcare interaction, but what about like avoided missed days of work, increased productivity, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So depending on how big you draw the circle, like you, you may end up with a slightly different range of your ROI and it can get complicated because you're looking at information at a population level across a variety of sectors. So you're right. But the data is pretty robust that even at the lowest end of ROI for, for lead abatement, it's, it's, it's just a slam dunk. It's, even, if you, even if you just look at the dollars and cents, we should have done this a long time ago. You mentioned vaccines, and I know you've been outspoken and done some writing about why vaccines are so important. First of all, where did this whole phenomenon of, of people, and, and especially in upper middle class, white families, this anti-vaccine um, sentiment, where did it come from? You know, I think it's a complex question. There are a lot of people who study the psychology of how people consume scientific and health information. I'm not one of those. I can tell you like what I observe. I think sometimes there is um, this feeling that we want to do things that are natural or that, you know, that that we want to avoid unnecessary interventions or we're worried about chemical exposure. So there can be this um, feeling that like less is more and that means that a vaccine is an intervention that I don't need. I sometimes hear that. I think the biggest thing is that vaccines have been a victim of their own success. Like people haven't seen the devastating consequences of vaccine preventable diseases. Um, at, at a large population scale. You know, there are countries where people walk for miles to get their kids vaccinated against polio because they see how devastating polio is every day. I think that's another issue. Um, although I will tell you, I, using that logic, I would have expected that vaccine hesitancy might actually be diminished during the time of this pandemic, a pandemic because people are seeing what it's like to have a pandemic for which there is no vaccine and how it affects our society and how we behave and interact with one another. I've actually kind of seen the opposite. I'm seeing vaccine hesitancy going up um, during this time, which is maybe a little bit counterintuitive. And I think it has to do with, and this might be sort of a third answer to your question, that you know there's been so much sort of shifts in information sharing, like not the greatest communication sometimes from public health agencies, this unfortunate politicization of public health information that I think has created this sort of like more widespread mistrust or amplified mistrust in sort of the whole medical establishment. So it's kind of like, I don't know what to believe. I keep hearing different things about COVID. Who can I really trust? You know what? I'm, I'm not even going to vaccinate. So I think it's also trusting information and, and where the information comes from and people's ability to like understand process and apply scientific information that's been sort of muddled by all of the social media and political mumbo jumbo that's getting in the way right now. I think there's there credibility though to the idea that there are negative side effects from vaccines. You know, vaccines are one of the maybe the best studied medical interventions that we provide, and their safety and efficacy is so well established. It's so well established. A lot of the issues that um, I find parents are worried about are really not 
they're not they're they're not scientifically based. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there on the internet about vaccines. Actually, um, I was reading there's some data recently about the degree to which health and science misinformation is downloaded and read online versus like true. Oh wow. Um, I, I feel like I saw it on on social media, ironically, but <laughs> I think it was it was saying that that disinformation and misinformation is is more likely to be read than real information when you look at health and science. I mean, vaccines are one category. Climate change is another. There are a lot of other COVID information. Um, I also think the other the other issue about about vaccines is that people misunderstand like it is a personal choice, but it's not just to protect yourself. Like people think. Well, what's it to you if I don't vaccinate my kids? Well, I try to remind people in our community, we're lucky that the vaccine rates as a community are relatively high. So you can kind of get away with not being vaccinated a little bit better than in a, a community that has lower vaccination rates. Because as you know, there's that herd immunity effect where we're creating this sort of wall of immunity to protect our entire community from some of these diseases. And sometimes we're protecting the most vulnerable among us who can't be vaccinated at all, like a newborn or somebody getting cancer chemotherapy or, or what have you. So I think people misunderstand that aspect. Um, and I, one of the things I, you know, there are so many evidence-based ways, this is something that I share with my patients, so many evidence-based ways to avoid chemicals of concern in our lives when it comes to consumer products, food, cleaning materials. There's so many evidence-based ways that we can, you know, become empowered about avoiding chemicals of concern in our households. Vaccines are not one of them. And like, I'm telling you a lot of times I'll talk to people who are worried about chemical exposure from vaccines, but they haven't really thought about, well, what about these other, like actually evidence-based ways for us to, um, to avoid chemical exposures? And it, it can be illuminating for people. And I think sharing that with families is one way to say, look, let's, yeah, sure, let's talk about chemical avoidance. Here we go. Here's what I can tell you about why vaccines are safe and effective. There is so much literature that that would take hours, so I won't bore you, but, but I often will give families like a bibliography if you really want to go read every primary study, um, have at it, but it's extremely well studied. I think most of those concerns are very Ill, uh, unfounded, and I also think that there's a lack of understanding about, about how vaccines actually work, as well as what the dire consequences would be if our immunization rates were to dip below sort of a critical level. So. So how can, with social media and so much of every, all the information we get is online these days, how do we as, as regular non-medical people, you know, vet the information that we're consuming to make sure it's reliable? Yeah, I think that's kind of the million dollar question for all of us. Like, like there's so much study in the communication realm and in the science realm about like the psychology of how information is consumed and also like the tactics we can use to be more thoughtful and mindful about about our sources of, of information. I mean, I definitely think like looking at the source, um, if it's a an organization or an agency, like looking at that organization or agency's history of affiliations or funders or endorsements is helpful. I think that um, if it's an individual, what is that person's credential? Do they have any major conflicts of interest? I know that's hard to do every time you read an article. Like that feels like a lot, but, but if you're, I don't know, I, I would hope that if we're consuming information that's changing our minds about something or changing the way we're behaving, like let's be really careful about who is giving us that information and what their conflicts of interest might be. I think that's really important. I've seen people, like people I like and trust who, who will share things on social media like um, that, that, that clearly come from a source where with a simple Google search, you can see that there, this is not, like it's it's not a real news organization. Maybe it's a shell organization. Maybe it's funded by a special interest group. Um, a, a friend shared some anti-vax information from this group that sounded like a med medical professional society. And I honestly can't even remember what it's called, but it has like physicians and surgeons in the title. And there are people with medical degrees in this organization, but if you look them up, you'll see that they are a conservative activist organization that also publishes information that is anti-immigrant, false information about reproductive health, I mean, demonstrably false information about reproductive health, false information about birth control and breast cancer, all kinds of things that are just demonstrably false. And so if you just Google that group, you can see that they have these political affiliations. And while you may like what they have to say about vaccines, if you have to happen to be anti-vax yourself, if you see that like 
everything else they publish, you're like, that's not true. I, I know it's not true. They're making up stuff about immigrants or about race and health and I mean, things that are just false then I would hope that you would then question, okay, well, even though this information is what I wanted to hear, it's coming from an organization that puts out false stuff all the time. I think we like to read what reinforce, you know, it's that confirmation yeah. bias. So I hope that we, I mean, me too, can get beyond that to actually see like who's saying it, what's their credential, what's their affiliation, and is there a conflict of interest? So what do you think is, I guess this is a two-part question, uh, Realistically, how soon will we have a COVID vaccine and um, will people take it? <laughs> I don't know what's realistic. I think that we are, you know, I've heard some super optimistic politicians talk about having a widely available vaccine in a matter of months. I don't see how that could happen so rapidly because, I mean, I think the testing of vaccine, a, a vaccine around the world is actually, it's going, you know, it's moving quite rapidly, but there's still safety testing to be done. There's still, there's an element of scaling the manufacture of the vaccine. I just don't believe that it, we're talking about a matter of like a couple months. I mean, I've heard some politicians talking about like by the end of the year, I just would be shocked. Um, that's just me speculating. I'm not deep in the the sort of public health world of vaccine development or, or even of COVID response. Um, so I think it, it I, I mean, it would be to me at, at best well into next year, but I, I honestly can't say, and I definitely would not hang my hat on a super optimistic date. I don't think that that's realistic. And as far as whether people will take it, you know, I don't know, because as I said, I was a little surprised by how baseline levels of vaccine hesitancy for existing well-established vaccines has, has dropped during the pandemic. So I, if you had asked me, like at the onset of all of this, would people take it? I would say, yeah, I mean, people will be in line to take it. But now I'm like, I don't know, because there's been so much confusion about the information that's out there that's really, unfortunately, eroded public trust. And it's really hard to win that back. So I'd like to think that a critical mass of us would, would get vaccinated, but I don't know. I don't know. I saw a meme that was like, if there were a treatment for COVID that prevented it 97% of the time, would you take it? And then like the punchline was, it's a mask. And like, look how many people are not wearing masks. That's a good point. I mean, I think that's a, that's a good sort of like, unfortunately, barometer of how a lot of the misinformation and confusing information has affected people's behavior. So yeah, it's it, honestly like trust of public health information is priceless. And I, I'm sorry to see that it's been eroded and you're, you're right. And I actually read another really interesting article about how this was about school reopenings, but it was talking about how in the states that were less, least likely to have mask mandates, who now have some of the highest rates of transmission are also the most likely ones to have schools open. I think it was like in the New York Times last week, whereas states that have been the most adherent to mask mandates like in the northeast and now their transmission rates are very low extremely low are also the least likely to have their schools open which is so interesting like like i had a I have a colleague who wrote a great piece about this um, in the atlantic about how okay we use evidence to close down now let's use evidence to carefully reopen in some of these states that are actually doing quite well but ironically and sadly the states that probably have no business reopening because they are have out of control community transmission rates, terrible mask adherence, no mandates around masks. Those are the ones that are kind of throwing the doors open. So it's just this mismatch that seems largely cultural and not evidence-based, which is really unfortunate. So what is your opinion on schools, uh, back to school season as a doctor and as a parent? You know, it's, um, it's kind of a, a, a sensitive topic for me right now because I'm witnessing um, as a primary care doctor, a lot of the negative influences of children, especially young and um, especially vulnerable children who are out of school. And also as a parent of young children, I'm seeing it in my own home. Um, I think that the, re the answer to that really is it depends on the community. So I actually really liked that piece in the New York Times that sort of showed a heat map of where the community rates of transmission were most compatible with school reopening and there are different flavors of what that could look like it's it's all in person it's hybrid you know but they had this really nice kind of um, illustration of that and it's true so the communities with the most out of control transmission rates probably should start out maybe even all virtual right they probably should be all virtual the communities that have lower rates of community transmission maybe that's not necessarily the case 
Um, and I also think it matters the age of the learner, like the age of the student. So we have some pretty good data that children under 10 don't transmit the virus as efficiently as older kids do. And also, um, and I, so I know it's just not just about the kids being sick, we're worried about teachers and staff, absolutely. So that's why I mentioned transition effic transmission um, efficiency. But then there are also some measures that schools can be taking to increase safety of in-person learning. It requires adequate resourcing of schools though. It includes personal protective equipment for teachers. I think for our youngest students, not returning to the old status quo is not necessarily the right answer in some of our older, poorly ventilated buildings. We need to improve the building infrastructure and the PPE for teachers and staff, which requires some investment. But there's also an element of like, what about getting outdoors more? You know, there are some school districts that are talking about that. How do we get the young kids out of their desks outdoors? Honestly, I think that probably is better for them anyway, COVID or no COVID. But from a public health standpoint right now, getting the kids outside. If we do have an environment where the younger kids are going back in person, the older kids are virtual for now, which I think makes sense in some communities, um, then maybe you have more buildings to work with. Maybe with like all this vacant office space now, are there creative ways we can shrink our class sizes? All of these things take money, they take resources, they take support for educators. And um, I've heard many people say, and I think it's exactly right, like right now teachers and parents are kind of left holding the bag to try to figure this out without any extra infusion of resources. So it's kind of an impossible conundrum, like their choices often are to go back to the status quo, which may or may not be the right choice, or to not go back at all. And it's also difficult to have these kinds of flexible, flexible solutions without um, an infusion of resources. What I'll tell you though is this, I do think we are understating the risk to students, especially the youngest students, most vulnerable students of being home. I think too often in the popular media, it's, it's like the risks of going to school are amplified right now because everybody's worried about COVID. The risks of staying home are understated. I am, tell, I, I am seeing such an uptick in mental health issues, kids who are obese getting more obese, a lack of recreation, their developmental needs are not being met, especially our youngest students. Virtual kindergarten, I mean, having done this in my own home, it just is hard to do well. I mean, the, there's no substitute for those kids being with their peer group at that age. Kids with special needs who get a lot of their therapies at school, you know, and for a lot of kids, school is a lifeline in a lot of ways. Um, and you may, we may argue like, I think too much of a burden is probably placed on schools anyway by a society that has kids living in unsafe conditions, not necessarily have enough food to eat and the schools are filling in for a lot of that. And that's probably not appropriate. We need to actually invest in communities in other ways, but it's a fact right now. So there are kids who are, um, who, for whom school is a lifeline beyond the learning opportunities who lack that lifeline. And so their mental, physical, developmental health is suffering greatly. I mean, this is gonna be a burden that I think, a price we are paying for a very long time. I mean, upticks in, in child abuse and neglect. I mean, we have parents who are desperate. They're, they have to work, they're essential workers. Their kids are not in school. They're, they're scrambling to find childcare, sometimes in suboptimal conditions. School also, often picks up on child abuse and neglect. So we're also seeing that the reporting of these issues through the schools is threatened by this. Um, you know, and then we're seeing like in my community, there are these quote unquote, and I kid you not, in-person in virtual learning centers that private enterprises are offering to desperate families to pay for their kids to be in a classroom to sit on a computer with their teacher at home. I mean, it's just, I think we're not framing the issue of schools in the right way. It should not be, is it safe for kids to go back to school? It is how can we collectively make it safe for kids and teachers to get back to school? It's a collective challenge. I think we need like these kinds of out of box thinking of getting kids outside, spreading kids out in creative ways. Maybe it's not a one size fits all for every age, for every community, but this idea that it's like two choices, back to the status quo or everybody at home and then every parent and teacher for him or herself, to me is just not sustainable. And it amplifies the enormous inequities that already exist. In my community, the private schools are all back in person. Public schools are not. Wow. Um, and so what does that mean for people? I, you know, their parents hiring teachers and these like, you know, educators to be at their house, to shepherd their kids through the school day and these pods or whatever, you know. It's just, to me, it's gonna just widen the gaps that already existed. I, I think it's not about, is it safe for kids? It's how do we make it safe? There's no choice. This like marking time forever. Um, if people don't realize it now, we will realize with these children who 
who are having these enormous detriments to their physical, mental, and developmental health for being at home. Um, we're we're going to be reaping what we've sown for a long time, and I really struggle with that. As a primary care doctor, I don't take care of as many of the sickest of the sick, and I totally, totally respect that we want to avoid the enormous risk uh, that COVID can pose for, for, for you know, people, some people who are infected, absolutely. Um, so I'm not suggesting we just throw open the doors without, without thinking about managing those risks. But as a primary care doctor, what I see is the enormous burden that is more chronic that we're gonna be suffering for a long time. So I guess that's my, that's my feeling. Not a one size fits all, we need more resources and we need to reframe the conversation to recognize that schools are every bit as essential as healthcare. And more essential maybe than restaurants and bars, as some people and are casinos. making point. And casinos. Why are our casinos open and the and elementary schools not open? That to me is just wildly backwards. Um, and I'm I'm an essential worker too. You know, I've been working this whole time. I know it's I know that it's hard to think about managing risk in a in a landscape of uncertainty. Like our own masking requirements changed wildly throughout the pandemic. We were going with and without PPE to work. I had kids coughing in my face. Like I, I know, and we have nurses in that position, environmental services staff in that position. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. But the fact is we do have more information now than we did in March. And so this idea that we're just kind of paralyzed waiting until it's like magically okay for schools to just go back to the status quo, I, I find it disappointing because I think if this could be an opportunity for, for some creativity and out of the box thinking to get especially our youngest and most vulnerable kids back sooner rather than later, I mean, that's what we all want. And unfortunately, the teachers and schools were left with an impossible choice because they did not have any infusion of resources or other sectors kind of helping out. It's becoming clear how interwoven the environment or environmental health and, and children's health are. They're one and the same. Um, how did you first get interested in uh, being an environmental activist alongside your medical practice? Well, I think as you know, and anyone who's listening who grew up in the Pacific Northwest like we did, to some degree that like shared consciousness about environmental stewardship kind of is like in the water and in the culture where we grew up. So I, I think as a private citizen, I'd always had this consciousness about environmental stewardship and kind of a connectedness to nature and outdoors, I think is common too for us who grew up there. Um, so that I think was pre-existing. In medical school, I, um, you know, I'd sort of always been really interested in health equity and social justice. And um, in medical school, I got to thinking a lot about the externalities we were creating in operating our hospitals, actually. So it was one of the things that first brought the two topics together for me, like, look at these, most, most, these smokestacks, like where's our energy coming from? Are we being mindful about that? What are we buying? Where does it come from? Where does it go? And look, here we are. I, I went to a medical school at the University of Michigan, so not too far from Detroit. Detroit has a lot of the same environmental health challenges as Cleveland. So thinking about like, you know, the, the incredibly high prevalence of childhood asthma, um, the environmental determinants of some of those chronic diseases like childhood asthma. At, meantime, we've got these puffing smokestacks at the hospital, like what, what's happening here? Are we like living up to our mission and the way we operate? So that was kind of my like entree into the intersection between environment and health. Um, but it really got me thinking and learning. And so I got involved with writing some cases for the medical school when we were revamping our curriculum um, around environmental health and child uh, health outcomes in Detroit. Sort of took that interest with me when I came to Cleveland, which in many ways is a very similar city, a lot of similar history. Um, so some of those learnings. And so, um, and, and now practicing in a city where the, the consequences of systemic injustice are so writ large in my patients to be able to really see, you know, I treat lead poisoning in my clinic. Well, that is really a problem of housing. The prescription for that problem is safe housing, you know, or seeing that air pollution is responsible for so many asthma exacerbations. It also contributes to birth outcomes, contributes to school readiness. So to, to be like down here, sort of trying to treat the downstream impacts of these issues um, really makes me feel like I wanna double down on intervening upstream. Like the prescription for those problems is not really an inhaler 
or more medical care. It's, it's clean air, it's safe housing, it's clean water. Um, the other thing I'll say is that um, race in the United States is the best predictor, the single best predictor of proximity uh, to environmental health hazards. So it, it sort of is just kind of in the same column as uh, it, it belongs in the conversation about systemic racism and health inequality because environmental injustice is a huge piece of that. Whether we're talking about air pollution, housing, water, chemical exposures, um, it's not by accident, it's by design. And I would say even further, you know, with climate change being sort of like the biggest public health and environmental health threat of our time, um, it's not just about disproportionate impacts of the health outcomes of environmental hazards, including climate change, which is primarily a public health issue to me. It's also about the root cause of some of these um, discrepancies. And I've actually heard some of my environmental justice colleagues talk about climate change in a way that really makes it clear that climate change is the result of uh, a culture that's based on extraction, exploitation, and disposal. Like, it's, it's no accident. When people are, are expendable, the planet is expendable. So I think um, the sort of intertwined nature of social justice and health equity and environmental issues are deeply intertwined. And, and I think as a pediatrician, you're like, you have a front row seat to see that because nobody is more harmed than kids. The kind of people who come to the pregame community, you know, do care very much about what's going on in the world. But what happens is, you know, there's that first step of awareness. We find out that these problems exist if we didn't grow up around them. And then, you know, there's, there's an emotional reaction. You know, we feel very, um, you know, sad, angry, sorrowful. And, and then sometimes that can lead to impotence instead of action. And so with problems as huge as climate change, how do we even begin to take action, you know, when the problem is so massive? Yeah, I think that's a common um, issue that we that we all face when we are confronted with these like massive these these massive problems. Whether it's and they're not unrelated problems, whether it's climate change or it's systemic racism or it's economic injustice or it's health inequality. Like those to me are all kind of the same problem. But however you want to say them, you you feel like oh my gosh, this is like a global existential crisis. What what do I do? And I think when it, when it comes to acting on climate, the thing that I feel really um, hopeful about is that there are so many local actions that we can take that are powerful. And I think that there's a growing coalition of voices beyond sort of the traditional environmental movement that really are kind of connecting the dots between some of these big ticket issues I just, I just described. I find that pretty hope inspiring too, that whether it's a, a, a person who comes from environmental stewardship or comes from like a racial justice point of view or comes from a health equity point of view, like we're all starting to speak the same language. I think that's pretty inspiring and reassuring. I also think that a lot of local action around like what you eat, how you get around and where you live, those are meaningful in your own impact on the climate as well as you, the example that you show to others. Um, and I think that we, the other thing I would say is that when it comes to climate change, we have the technology to accelerate to a clean energy economy right now. Yesterday, we have it. It's becoming more and more economically um, competitive to do so. There's no, the only reason we aren't doing it is that we lack the political will to do it. So each of us has the power to build that in our own networks and communities. I mean, I think in this year, 2020, that means like, like access to, to democracy is a big part of the solution to some of these big problems. Um, so actually we have a, a coalition of clinicians in Ohio who are focused on climate change and health related advocacy. There's actually a growing number of state coalitions like that all over the country, which is another thing I find pretty inspiring. And one of the things we're doing, one of our action items this year is like to provide a prescription for democracy, like helping our patients and staff and each other register to vote and make sure that we vote. Like even within our practices, we, we register patients to vote in clinic. Wow. Totally nonpartisan, right? We're just saying we want you to, so there's nothing prescriptive about it. It's just about the how you vote. Prescription is part of like your health and your community's health is to vote. And part of your health is to fill out the census. Like we, we're doing that in our practice. We have census outreach and voter outreach in our practice and we're definitely not alone. And so back to your question about what individuals can do, like we all have a role to play in um, increasing voter turnout and access to democracy and setting an example for our peers 
framing the issue of climate change as a public health emergency, I think is really important, and connecting the dots with each other and our policymakers about how systemic racism, climate change and environmental injustice, economic inequity, and everything that's being underscored by COVID, like those are not separate problems. They're all the same thing and they share common solutions. So I think we all have a role to play there and it can feel big and daunting, but what we need is politi political will, that's all of us. We need people to vote, that's all of us. And then if we each are doing something to demonstrate action towards the outcome we wanna see, then that's powerful too. So I don't think people, I hope people don't feel defeated by what what may appear to be this insurmountable hill, because I, I feel maybe more hopeful now than I have in a long time. Yeah, my fantasy at the beginning of COVID was, you know, when the whole world was staying home in this brief moment in time in March and April, and the earth literally got to breathe because we weren't traveling and, and all the other things we weren't doing. You know, it, it showed we have the will or the ability at least to take rapid action in a crisis. And what if we could treat climate change with the same urgency? That's exactly right. We know how powerful we can be collectively because communities that did rapidly respond to the pandemic, I mean, how powerful. Um, and so I, I think it shows that we have the collective will to take bold actions when when we commit to it collectively. And you're, you're absolutely right. Whether it's climate change or systemic racism, it's the same kind of bold collective action. We should treat those like the existential crises they really are. Um, and I also think that, you know, it's the unfortunate part about a little bit of what you just said and how people think about it is that this idea that we had to sort of like shut down and be disconnected from our regular lives. And somehow that's what it takes to solve climate change. Because we did say that you know, it is true that air pollution went way down when people were quarantined, but I, I just see it a different way. I just feel like, wow, how resilient is the earth that earth can take a breath with us doing this for a relatively short amount of time. I think that's very hope inspiring. And I think instead it's like, just like we were talking about with schools, like we should not just be marking time to go back to the way we used to do things. I really hope that this year is like a, a, a pivot point where it's, it's, it's about like going back to a better normal that is closer to the kind of like just sustainable regenerative economy that is going to you know carry us into the future because if we go back to the way things were before we'll be just as vulnerable to a crisis like this like clearly our supposed prosperity was you know a, a house of cards because like this pandemic blows through and we it's just showed what what our weaknesses really are what they always have been so that's why i think like if we're using this as a pivot point to return to a new normal that to me would be like the ideal outcome from everything that's gone on over the past year. But it is amazing. I mean, that, that, that those striking pictures of cleaner air, like I, I mean, it was striking. And, you know, the jury's still out about some of the stuff I'm, I'm gonna say, but I'll just, I'll point out, for example, that the rates of premature birth during this pandemic have gone way down. Now, there's probably multiple reasons for that, but I wonder if a, la if a cleaner air is not part of it because, Dirty air is an important determinant of premature birth. I mean, I heard someone speculating on the radio about this and he was like, oh, maybe it's like women are home from work and they're less stressed. And I don't know, maybe some people are less stressed, but some of our most vulnerable moms, our most at-risk expectant moms are not relaxing during this pandemic. Yeah, I know a lot of people it's are stressed. Stressful. It's super right. It's super stressful for some of our most vulnerable people. So I'm not sure I buy that. I think air pollution got going down is a better explanation. I'm sure it's a number of things, but it's interesting. It'll be interesting to learn from and unpack all of that. Definitely. Um, so you've been doing so much work behind the scenes with different organizations um, as an activist in this space. Um, what have you seen going on behind the scenes that maybe the general public doesn't realize about environmental regulation in the US? over the last three and a half years of the current administration. Uh, I know it's a long answer, but uh, like bring to light some of the things we don't even realize are happening. Yeah, I think, I think that it, partly because of the news cycle and the way we consume information, it's, I'm not the first to observe that our, our attention is like swinging from one fire to the next all the time, you know? So it's hard to like even process some of the, maybe the more wonky things that are happening in the, gov in the federal government or at the state government level or with regulations, some of these issues that are very important to environmental protection. Um, and also there's so many other categories like this where I feel like under the surface of all these fires, 
sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm missing, you know, I'm missing all that's going on under the surface. So I think it happens to all of us. When it comes to environmental protections that relate to policy and regulation, we really have been on a disturbing um, uh, trajectory in the wrong direction over the past few years. Um, and I find it especially disturbing in the heart of a respiratory pandemic that is underscoring how important environmental determinants of health are and how health inequities are being outlined for us in this really tragic way. We know that air pollution is a, is a determinant of COVID outcomes, just like every respiratory disease. So even during this time where I think we're, we're getting the message that what we need to be doing is investing in public health to at the same time see this incredible walk back of environmental protections is even more disturbing given the context. Just a few examples. Um, the administration, um, the, the current administration within the EPA has um, rolled, back, rolled back clean air protections from the mercury air toxic standards to not strengthening ozone standards, national, the um, ambient air quality standards, the clean power plan. Um, there are, the list goes on and I know it sounds wonky, but the, the message is air quality protections have gone way backwards, years back. Um, and another example might be chemical regulation. So chemical oversight has gone in the wrong direction over the past few years. A couple of examples, um, chlorpyrifos, which is a toxic pesticide, was, was um, deemed to be unsafe and was going to be banned, and that was reversed. Um, decisions not to regulate certain dangerous chemicals in drinking water, like perchlorate. So there's a number of examples that sound wonky, but the bottom line is whether it's safer chemicals, cleaner water, cleaner air or climate action on every level. It's not just been about undoing past protections in many circumstances is actually going even further. So like, for example, the clean power plan, we didn't just nix the clean power plan, we're replacing it with something that actually weakens pre-existing elements of the Clean Air Act. So it's, it's worse than just undoing what existed three years ago. It's actually going even further back. And, and, and the worst part is that it's in service to polluting industries. So when we talk about environmental injustice, including climate change, being the product of extraction, exploitation, and disposal, it's in service of collecting capital and power into the hands of a few at the expense of many, right? And that's exactly what these regulations are reinforcing, is to put power and money in the pockets of polluting industries at the expense of all of the rest of us. Because if you look at at who is making those decisions in the EPA. We have a former, former coal lobbyist who's leading the EPA. Um, we have people who are industry representatives really steering the ship. It's really like the fox guarding the hen house. And look, I'm not, um, I think that partnership with businesses is really important. So, so, I mean, hear me when I say I'm not sort of putting all businesses into the same bucket here, but it is true that there are many chemicals companies and fossil fuel companies who are banking on regulations that benefit them and allow them to externalize risk, right? Externalize risk and internalize profit. So we are paying the cost of pollution. They are pocketing the profits. And that is what these measures from the EPA are throwing open the doors to allow, encourage, aid, and abet. And that's what I think is outrageous. And that's what people need to know. And that's another reason why your voice as a constituent and your vote really matter. And it's, it's like, I, sometimes it feels like a game of whack-a-mole. I'm like, I just called about this rule and now it's a, you know, I just, we just had this conversation about methane and now it's ozone and it's, it feels like a game of whack-a-mole, but I have to believe that our voice matters. And I think that when people think about their vote and, you know, I also feel like child health shouldn't be partisan issue and environmental stewardship shouldn't be a partisan issue. It never really used to be to the degree it is now. So it's not, it's not, I, I, I'm not trying to communicate as a partisan activist, but it is true that the current EPA has, has really committed these health harming outrages over the past few years. Too few people know about it because of all the other fires we've been dealing with in our lives. But I think it's powerful for us to know and for us to know that these are the kinds of things that make our vote count even more than we may think. When I hear people say, what difference does it make? What difference does it make in the end? It's all politics anyway. Well, this, this is a big difference. And it's just, it's a drop in the bucket. It's just one example. And not just voting every four years, but my cause is always vote all the way down the ticket and vote in the primaries because the local leaders, yeah, 
do decide a lot of these laws. Absolutely. I mean, voting in local elections, voting in the primary, civic engagement in your own town, so important. Actually, I have to say, um, to get back to some hopeful messages, in this environment of the federal, um, of, of federal EPA regulations moving us in the wrong direction, there are cities and states that are leading the way. I mean, California has made some chemicals rules that way outpace what the EPA is requiring, and they are guiding the rest of the country. There are cities that are making bold climate neutral pledges. You might say it's just one city, but it's not. They add up, and it's the sum of those cities and the sum of the states that are moving the country in the right direction, even when like the federal government is, is maybe taking a more wrong-headed approach. So like local elections have consequences too. And I know you speak really eloquently about that, but it's absolutely true. The idea of just kind of showing up and voting for president every four years is not what we're talking about. We're talking about civic engagement. Absolutely. Well, speaking of voting, I have to mention, especially because we're, we're taping this uh, the day after the RNC, the week after the DNC, I'm Black, you're Indian. Kamala, how are you feeling about it? <laughs> yeah, I have to say, you know, what an inspiring personal story. I mean, even politics aside, um, I think many people have justifiable questions and concerns about maybe her policy positions, and we can debate about that and, um, and, and what have you. But all of that aside, her personal story, I think, is really inspiring, especially, you know, as a first-generation immigrant myself. I think we all see elements of our identity every time um, a mold is broken when it comes to elected officials, you know, when, um, when and, and of course, I think just as an accomplished, ambitious, powerful woman, she's mm -hmm. an amazing, you know, mold breaker in that respect, too. But I'm thinking about, like, Barack Obama, a lot of people, you know, really being moved by the fact that he's Black and he's biracial and, like, uh, completely. Another aspect of his identity that was really personally resonant with me is that his name wasn't like Jim or Bob or something, you know, right. Barack Obama. And as somebody who, um, as a first generation immigrant, lived in a community without a ton of diversity, um, you know, we, we both grew up there, that, you know, that I remember being tortured for my name, you know, just made fun of all the time. Oh yeah, I get it. <laughs> right, right. And like just, it just, and willful mispronunciation. Like you would try again and again and it would be like, I don't, it, it, and it happens still to my kids. Like my kid had a, my daughter had a, a substitute teacher who basically told her to not correct him when, when he mispronounced her name. So to have a, a woman named Kamala, which is a beautiful Indian name, which means Lotus. Um, and her middle name is Devi, which means goddess, that we have this beautiful Indian name. Um, she talked about her immigrant parents and her mother's immigrant story could have been my family's immigrant story. Her na mother's native language is the same as my native language. We're from the same community in South India. Her family photos from her mother's side, like they could be my family's photos. Um, her, so to, for her to be talking about her immigrant family and especially her culture that is really exactly my culture was, I never thought in a million years. I mean, the, she said, she mentioned that her family includes her chippies when she was listing her family and Chithi means mother's younger sister, it means younger aunt, basically, in, in my language, which is Tamil. And um, she, when she mentioned that, my, my daughters were like, oh, I have a Chithi too. And my sister, the next day, we were texting back and forth because my sister is my kid's Chithi. And uh, we said, look, the top trending search term on Google today is Chithi because nobody knew what it meant. So they were looking it up. And I was like, this is great. This is our moment. So just like little things like that. Did I ever think my native language would be spoken in a vice presidential address in my lifetime? Like, are you kidding me? Definitely not. <laughs> and then the fact that she's biracial and is able to occupy multiple identities at once and really mm -hmm. unapologetically, mm -hmm. yes, I'm black and I'm an Indian American and I'm a second generation immigrant and this, and I'm this. And you know, the, I think we, we struggle with that. Um, I feel like we talked about it a little bit with Barack Obama that people kind of struggled with him being both black and biracial, right. you know? And oh, yeah. so fascinating to me. Right. And she occupies those identities really fearlessly. But I think just purely personally and selfishly, just to hear these allusions to a shared culture that is very specific. It's exactly my culture. It's a South Indian language that is my language. To hear it coming out of her mouth and to have a woman with this Indian name, uh, you know, at the top of our, of, you know, the sort of political world right now is just a really remarkable moment for a lot of, I think, immigrants and women and black women and a lot of us who are not used to seeing ourselves represented and the way that she represents so many people so well.
So as we uh, draw to a close, what are you feeling optimistic about right now in your work? I think one of the most hopeful things about my work right now is how young people are leading when it comes to environmental justice. And when I say young people, I'm talking about like school children, teenagers, we've seen it with climate activists, um, we've seen it in the environmental justice movement. I mean, I have had the privilege of seeing indigenous youth, black young people, Hispanic young people, frontline communities whose young people are stepping up to take the reins and like own their power and demand environmental justice. And they have no trouble seeing the connected dots between health equity and racial inequity and racism and environmental justice, like all these issues. I think the youth that are leading right now, like they don't need to be taught how those two, those, all those things go together. I think the rest of us sometimes are catching up. So I think youth leadership is really giving me hope. And I also feel like this moment of crisis is teaching all of us how all of these big issues are connected and how climate solutions, social justice solutions, health equity solutions, dismantling systemic racism are all really the same thing. And I think that that's not as hard for people to understand. And once we understand a problem, I think we can solve it. So that's, that's given me a lot of hope. I think we've come a long way in our collective understanding. I think we've shown we can care for one another in the way we've been able to react in many of our communities to the pandemic. And I think that the youth are kind of leading the way. And as a pediatrician, that's like, nothing's better. So that's what I would say. Any advice to parents out there who are trying to get their kids and, and themselves through this weird COVID time? Yeah, I just hope that parent, I'm speaking to myself here too, I hope parents will have some grace with themselves. Um, I think that, I, I hope that they have some grace with their kids. It's just, it's a time that is really challenging for everyone. And I guess I would say too that, um, I think I've heard you say like, use the term suffering Olympics, like, yeah. Yeah, like I think that we sometimes get stuck in a lot of different ways when we sort of place ourselves in, in context. Like I've heard some families say, well, I, I know that relatively speaking, it could be worse and I have a lot of privileges, so I don't really want to complain. It's like, you know what, that's true. You can acknowledge your privilege and still your pain can be real and we need to acknowledge it and it, it owe, you're owed attention, you know what I mean? And similarly, like parents who are so hard on themselves or you know, hard on their kids. It's just, it's, I think it's a hard time. So I think it's having, having some grace, like, yeah, acknowledging what's going on around you, but validating that what you're feeling deserves some attention. Um, and then, you know, I think a lot about kids and families because of my profession, but to me, like the kind of community building that I'm aiming for in all of my advocacy is not limited to kids and families. And some of the people I love the most are not parents. Um, there are plenty of people who have different family structures. There are plenty of people who live alone. There are plenty of people um, who rely on their village who are their chosen family. And that's really hard right now because you, you, like, you have to be really choosy about who you can be with and you miss your village. And even though I am a parent, like my village and my chosen family is really important to me too. So I guess I just wanna say for parents and kids have some grace, but also let's remember that we have child-free friends, we have parent, kids, people who are not parents, we have older people, we've got people of all ages with different family structures who need to be acknowledged too. I think it's a way of, of bringing us together to have some consciousness around that. Very well said. Thank you so much, Aparna, for your time today and for all the work that you're doing on behalf of our community and our country. Thanks for having me, it was a pleasure. Take care. Awesome, have a great weekend, everybody, game on. Bit it cold like lyrically, I'm a problem. That's when the show starts.